um, as a writer with a fairly romantic view of consciousness and a lifelong flip phone user, uh, it's a little bit surreal for me to be giving <laughs> a TEDx talk and to be talking about AI. Um, in the past year, over the past year, I wrote a play called Doomers because I became very compelled by the story of the firing and rehiring of Sam Altman. Doomers is a boardroom drama, and in order to write this play, which I saw as a kind of classic Greek tragedy, tragedy I had to engage with AI literally and figuratively, and that meant not only traveling to San Francisco, hanging out with rationalists and, and, hang, and hacker houses, and immersing myself in San Francisco and Palo Alto culture, I also had to use LLMs kind of for the first time in my life. And that experience really changed my view of writing, and it's still changing my view of writing. And I think I might be the first person to credit AI on a play program. I might be wrong about that, but I think we were. So we credited uh, Claude and ChatGPT on Doomers as dramaturgs. For those of you who don't know what a dramaturg is, it's kind of an in-house critic or research assistant. And it turns out that the LLMs were quite helpful in helping me answer questions about like what would an ethicist think in this situation? What would a lawyer think in this situation? What would a VC think? And helping me map out the um, kind of character epistemology of the people I was writing about who I wasn't as familiar with being from New York City and having absolutely no background in tech whatsoever. Um, and that's where I enter. So Matthew and I started working together after I saw Dumas uh, because I was overhearing a conversation in the audience between two women who were pretty distressed that AI had been used in the creation of this play. Um, and it got me thinking about the idea of people receiving AI-generated creativity, what that means and, and what that reflection of creativity means for us as humans. And so I went to Matt with an idea that I thought was immediately going to be shut down. <laughs> and he very generously humored the idea, which was to train an LLM based on his corpus of work. So the way that an LLM works is it's a, uh, basically a text predictor that's trained on vast amounts of information um, from the internet. And the way that I did it is I fine-tuned it on his corpus of work so that the model would replicate his style of writing. Um, I'm a daughter of two writers, and so I thought that this proposal was going to be um, not only tough to sell, but pretty offensive. <laughs> uh, and Matt, I, I'm curious, why did you say yes? Um, <laughs> I'm very competitive, first of all. Uh, so I saw that, and I think this is going to be increasingly true as, like a, as a footnote to this conversation, that writers I can't shy away from engagement with LLMs and AIs that are that are writing. Like I think to say I don't want the competition feels um, disingenuous. I, I feel like if you believe in human creativity, you have to kind of like face face the. I don't know if it's an enemy, but the other, the digital other. So I felt. Um, that I needed to be courageous and say yes, but I also, we've been talking about a lot this book the last few days, but when I was 20, I had this big existential crisis. Um, I was studying philosophy undergrad, and I just had this crisis about the soul, about the meaning of life, and I read a lot of different books in kind of every field, but one that uh, really stuck with me was Gudel Asher Bach by Douglas Hofstetter, and I really, I grew up playing the piano and listening to classical music, and so I was listening, also listening to a lot of Bach, because it was a spiritual crisis, and that the model of mind that, that Hofstadter, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this book, um, kind of proposes that, we're, that we are emergent properties, that we come out of, you know, like ant hill, that we're like anthills and that we're uh, patterns that just get more and more and more complex until something else happens that we call a soul. I found that weirdly consoling and I never really forgot about that. So I think even though I had a somewhat mystical and still do and romantic idea of, of the soul, I also wanted to understand, well, if I'm at the top of this pyramid, there, what is underneath it, and can this process <laughs> teach me something about me and about and about my own the limits of my own creativity and the origins and roots of my own cre creativity? I'm curious what you thought you would discover, and if you were afraid in a way, like you said, your parents are writers. Were you were you afraid of discovering something that maybe you didn't want to know? Did you want to protect the mystique of literature and creativity? I haven't asked you this question before. So I... No, I yeah. wasn't afraid okay. of that. Yeah. I was interested in moving the starting point of the conversation. I felt that yeah. so much of the conversation around LLMs creating art, writing mm -hmm. in particular, had been so hypothetical that this felt like a step towards um, something more concrete that we could tangibly play with. Yeah. 
And I really liked the idea that instead of just saying, is it going to write what Matt writes? And yeah. is it going to be in your, in your tone of voice? What does it mean to you as a writer and as a creative? Um, I think I just described an LLM as a text predictor. And when Matthew described the story of being 20 years old and having an existential crisis and reading GEB, I was, as an engineer, I'm thinking, this is, he's talking about what, a, what we do with LLMs. It's a, he's, he's talking about his, his training data, his data set mm -hmm. that he's been trained on. And these emergent properties are, in theory, the outputs that we get from these uh, predictive models. And so, more than anything, I was interested in the same way that I was interested in these women being upset by or curious about the role of um, LLMs in the play. I wanted to understand what it meant especially in the context of questions that we've asked ourselves for a long time. Um, so I'll give an example of uh, something that Matt and I have been talking about a lot, yeah. uh, just to simplify this context um, down, which is a piece of dialogue. I guess I have to talk about the dialogue. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, as another aside, like what Isabel was talking about, um, training data, I had to admit, like working with AI has you realize that you learn to write through acquiring training data. In the humanities, we call it reading. Um, <laughs> and, that really worked, huh? Um, and uh, I remember when I was 20 and I was having, part of this crisis was also realizing I wanted to be a writer, I wanted to be an artist, and I wanted to be great. And I, so I wanted to read all the books in the Western canon, the Eastern canon, as much as I could. Like I had this immense hunger because I had this immense sense of uh, incompetence and futility, you realize you don't know how to do something. And the only way that I felt that I could learn, the only way that I felt like I was learning was just through constant inputting, which before I learned, this was 15 years before AI, but I, now I understand that that was a kind of way of building up a, a data set. Um, and the sense of excitement that I felt internally as a person uh, is probably how engineers feel when they're seeing breakthroughs in, in they're LLMs. Um, so I think, so that's, that's one, I think, important analogy between human creativity, especially like human writing and, and LLM writing, is they, they have the same kind of starting process. You put in a lot of stuff. Um, so one kind of thesis we're going to float out there today is that eventually is that uh, we actually can become better writers through, through the, the kind of challenge that AI and LLMs present to us as writers, that it's not necessarily that we want writing to be done for us by AI, but that we can learn about our own process through seeing how AI does it too. So we have this really simple two-line string of dialogue, which we have Joe and Bob. I don't know who's which. <laughs> <laughs> Joe says um, to Bob, do you want a cup of coffee? And Bob says yes. So that little string of language can be AI generated and it can be human generated. And there's absolutely no real reason to make a distinction. What really matters, I think, is the gap between do you want coffee and yes? And the context around, do you want coffee and yes? So I forget what I said first, Bob or Joe, but Joe says, yes, I want coffee. Joe could be thirsty. Joe could be, has not, Joe hasn't slept. Joe has committed a murder and is nervous and is trying to drink the coffee to hide the fact that he's committed a murder. Um, Joe could be being polite. Like really there are infinite ways to contextualize that situation. And in that gap between do you want coffee and yes, each character could have an entirely an extremely rich set of internal reactions, thoughts, whatever. And part of writing is actually about simulating those two pieces of consciousness, those two consciousnesses. And really rich writing is not about, you don't have to make that piece of dialogue sound good. That's fine, that's good writing. But what really matters is your ability to set up the what follows by developing those rich, the, the sort of internal games that each of those characters are playing. Um, so I want to know what you think about this because I've run out of ways to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so this was a huge unlock for us to yeah. use the tech term uh, because it, it kind of um, it pacified the conversation. We were saying even if the LLM were to generate something that Matt could write, even if it was verbatim the same thing, it would still be interesting to us because we're trying to understand the how and the why. So if the LLM writes, you know, do you want co coffee? Yes. And then Matt writes it. Well, maybe the reason Matt wrote it was because he went out and he had a fight with the barista. Or maybe mm. he fell in love with the barista. Mm. Or maybe he hates coffee and he wants to live vicariously through this character that wants coffee. We don't know. And I think that's what's interesting to us as creatives working with the technology is thinking about all of these um, sort of obfuscated ways in which decisions are made 
Um, we've been referencing a story a lot by um, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, Pierre Menard, the author of Don Quixote. Um, and it's a really great example of how these questions have been discussed for so long. Um, it's a story from 1939, and it's essentially, the premise is that uh, Pierre Menard, the French essayist writer, um, wants to recreate the text of Don Quixote, not through copying it, but by, through living the experience of Cervantes. And then in the story, he spontaneously writes a few pages. After years and years of trying, Pierre Menard accidentally writes a few pages of Don Quixote that are identical to Don Quixote. And then Borges, or his fictional ironic na narrator in the story, analyzes the differences between the two identical texts. So the joke and the paradox of the story is the two identical texts are, can be interpreted in different ways based on who you think the author is. And I think we realize that in a, in a deep, hard to articulate way, this is a perfect, the story is a perfect metaphor for um, LLMs and, and people and for LLMs trained on people. So I can't prove logically that um, Isabel's Matt GPT that Bob trained <laughs> in my work couldn't accidentally, if it could simulate 100 trillion times one of my, you know, a play with the same premise as my play, that it wouldn't accidentally produce something at some point that exactly resembled um, what I made. So that, that kind of leaves us in a really uh, strange place. I think, again, th this talk has no real, it leaves us in a, in a really kind of disturbing but exciting place at the same time. LLMs can do what we do. They can produce strings of language, and there's a non-zero chance that they could produce strings of language exactly like our strings of language. Um, so then the next question is, well, what do we do about that? Like, how do we respond, and can we redeem human creativity and, um, create a possibility as humans that, and, and is there something that we do that LLMs can't do? So it's, it's clearly not just producing language. That's, that is a shared property of both, both kinds of consciousnesses. So. And I think there's something that complicates the relationship here because there's the role of anthropomorphization, great word, <laughs> uh, which is essentially the idea that we personify these machines. And it's something that I think causes a lot of, um, that adds to the discomfort of using these machines and discomfort in engaging with this text. So I want to ground that part of the conversation in a piece of history from the 1960s from the computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum. He created something called the ELISA experiment, which was ultimately called the ELISA effect, which was essentially he created this um, program that was a psychotherapist, and he had his friends and colleagues come and interact with the psychotherapist with the big disclaimer that it was a program and that they should not confide in the program. Well, of course, they confided in the program, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he basically started disavowing the field of, of AI. Um, and he, you know, if he, was, if he was here today in 2025, he would actually have a lot of supporters, think, you know, Jeffrey Hinton, but uh, unfortunately, he uh, was one of the only dissenters at the time. I bring this up to say that I think in the same way that um, the reason I was interested in doing this experiment with Matt in the first place was because I wanted to move the marker of where this conversation started. I think when we look at the role of personifying these machines, it actually brings us back because it adds a level of fear and intimidation because we start to imbue these models with um, qualities. It feels easier to interact with them if they have qualities. It feels easier to... I heard someone the other day say that they were fighting with their AI. <laughs> and, um, and you know what, if you, if you interact with these models enough, you will start to feel like you're fighting with them. Because what's the difference between simulating a fight with them <laughs> and, and fighting with them? Um, and so it brings us back also to this idea of Borges, of if, if the text is the exact same, what is the difference? And we cannot prove that it isn't the same. One of the other things we discovered was that um we're having a lot of the same discussions in 2020, the 2020s and 2025 that uh, happened in literary departments and philosophy departments in the 70s when structuralism argued that language, not the author, is, is kind of the, the most significant thing in a text. We even started using the word text rather than book because of the arguments of structuralism. Um, and I also, ha I, we, we had another discovery, which is that, or I, I had this, uh, another kind of epiphany in our, in our in our work together and our conversations together that um, I feel like I'm in somewhat in the position of uh, Harold Bloom, who was a l very famous literary critic who was responding to structuralism in the 70s, uh, was a scholar of romantic poetry and kind of a, a Kabbalist mystic himself who wanted to try to find ways to redeem the notion of an individual author. 
against this argument that it's really language and the oscillations within language that are doing the work and not people. And so Bloom um, developed this theory of the anxiety of influence, which basically says that every, writers are responding to writers from the past, Shakespeare, Milton, Virgil, whomever, and that it's the a misre all writing is a misreading of what comes before it, text which comes bef come before it. And a weak misreading just kind of weakly repeats the ideas and the tropes of the previous text. And a strong misreading takes what comes from the past and turns it into something new and original, sublime. And this again reminded me a lot of what, what is happening with, um, mm. with AI, that ultimately we also kind of thought of this thought experiment where if you could travel back in time and put an AI text in a library and you pulled it off a shelf, you would have to respond to that text just like it were any other book, like if you didn't know what it was. And it could have an influence on you. You could experience the anxiety of influence with an AI text. It can, you can weakly misread or strongly misread AI. And so to me, that was a major revelation in, this, in, in our conversation that ultimately, because AI is language and it's just it produces language, at least LLMs produce language, they're not really that different than dead authors from the past. They might be worse writing, they might not be making, they might not be Shakespeare, but we do have the same kind of basic anxiety of influence about them. We have to choose to kind of either strongly or weakly, we, have, we can either kind of give in and be weak misreaders of AI, we can start to sound like AI, or we can respond to AI and try to not sound like AI. We can try to find new tropes, um, and we can try to find that distance between do you want coffee, in that distance between <laughs> do you want coffee and yes, we can try to get deeper into the, their con the consciousness of those two characters and try to find some kind of um, mysterious, ineffable part of human nature that um, we only can really acquire through getting broken up with and going to funerals and drinking a Red Bull before a TED talk <laughs> <laughs> um, that an AI couldn't experience and think of. But it pushes us forward. AI can push us forward in the same way that my anxiety over being worse than Tolstoy or worse than Goethe or worse than Emily Dickinson is gonna make me wanna work harder and, and respond. Well. AI, wanting to be better than AI can actually do the same thing for us. We can treat it as an opponent in a contest rather than someone who's just going to do our homework for us or write our plays for us. And it adds a moment of friction. Mm -hmm. um, it adds a moment of reflection where you're reminded that you have agency in these interactions around the way in which you're going to frame it. So we've talked about this as a, you know, a reflection of theory of mind, but it's also a way in which you can reflect on your own theory of mind around mm -hmm. the way in which you want to gain insight into yourself and the way that you think, um, learn your patterns, mm -hmm. um, realize, you know, training this model on, on Matt's language, I found, it was, we were discussing this the other night, so many patterns that Matthew's like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah, I had no idea that I was doing this or I had an inkling, but I hadn't seen it formalized on a page. Um, and we've been talking about it a lot in the context of chess uh, because chess was computerized, uh, you know, in the, in the mid 1900s. Uh, perhaps even earlier, and chess players haven't gotten worse, and chess players don't play computers in, in tournaments, but yet they continue to play them. Um, and it's an interesting framework to think about uh, using LLMs in writing, because I think it redefines the role of using these tools as really thinking about the intention. You know, if I'm learning the guitar, I'm not picking up the guitar every time saying, I need to be as good as Bob Dylan. Maybe I'm picking up the guitar because my grandfather played it and it feels important to me uh, to learn and follow in the tradition of my family. And so thinking about it as an avenue to reflect and challenge yourself on why you're embarking on these creative endeavors, I think is a really helpful way of positioning this. Yeah, looks like we're out of time. So last word will be, I think the one really practical takeaway is if you have writer's block and you feel stuck and you're feeling like you're repeating yourself, train an AI on your own writing, <laughs> see what it's doing and then do the opposite and maybe something new will happen. Thank you so much. <laughs>